so this morning we have sung about Jesus. He is the everlasting life. We have sung about how he is unfailing. That he is trustworthy. That his ways are higher than our own ways. And as I thought about this morning, this verse came to mind, these verses. It's in 1 John. 1 John, verse 5, says this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. That God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And this is the best part. If we confess our sin, today, the light that we talk about, it's not just kindly. It's not just love towards other people. It's a light that the darkness runs from. That is God. forgiveness of our sin that separates us from him. And he invites us into the life that puts that light in us. And so any peace, any joy, any love, any good is going to come from him and not our own performance. Who is the king on the throne? So this morning, as we sing this song, if you believe in Jesus and have a relationship with him in this room, let's worship him. Let's just tell him how good he is, acknowledge him how good he is, that he brings it to pass. That Jesus, you make darkness tremble, you silence fear, you do something bigger than what we can do. you sing today. Let this be something that that gets into your heart. Let this be a time where we remove distractions and we say, okay, God, I know the specifics of what you've done in my life and I am am acknowledging you. I want to know you in my heart today.
sing this chorus with me. Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had not the crimson stain he washed it white as snow so there's that Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had not the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Dear Jesus, we know that any peace, any hope, any light, any comfort, from you, any strength, any goodness, it's all you, God. Let us be thankful today, Lord, that you paid it all, past, present, and future sin, the very thing that could separate us. Just pray that we would be ever focused, our eyes attentive to who you are. Let us pay attention, God. No matter what goes on around us, that you would continually remind us that you are the light. us to view others the way you view them. And God, if you would use us to be vessels and beacons of your very own light that you give us when we enter into a relationship with you. Jesus, we love you, and today we just ask that your word would go forth into our hearts with strength, that you would be with Steve as he shares from your scripture, that through him, you would say what you want to say this morning, and that you would work in us, change us.
hope you're doing great out there and everybody watching online. Um, welcome to City Hope Church. Um, if you're new with us, man, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Steve, one of the pastors here and uh, City Hope Church. We've been uh, we've been kicking this thing around for a while. We're we're uh, a younger church. We're a church plant, but uh, so we don't. We don't pretend to have it all together and being a perfect church, but I think that's probably a good thing. You know what I'm saying? This is hopefully you feel at home and uh, you can find somebody where you're like, hey, I, I get what you I get you, man. Um, and uh, find find some commonality, find a place of home, at least get a good cup of, cup of coffee while you're here and uh, learn something from the word of God. And if you're that kind of person, you're kicking the tire, whether you are um, 18 or 85, um, you, maybe you are still um, trying to answer that question of who Jesus is. Um, we're especially glad that you're here. Um, a few things that I just want you to keep in mind, I guess, is um, number one, if you're a first-time guest, fill out a card and we in the lobby. If you want to stay anonymous, that's cool. If you would love to uh, connect with us in some way, fill out that card and well, we have a gift for you in the lobby. Um, number two is um, offering. You can give online at city-hope.com or there's two drop boxes by the door, two little black drop boxes. And uh, I just wanna reiterate this again. If you're a first time guest or you're first time watching online, we really highly encourage anyone who um, is a first time guest that offerings are not for you. So we're not asking you to give. And uh, by way of, it's like kind of like, housekeeping announcement stuff. Um, tomorrow, we, we're having a special prayer in um, right in the town square. Some local pastors are having prayer and some readings from sermons from Martin Luther King. It will be about a 30-minute um, program. Different pastors in the community are going to be partaking in that, and I'll be one of the people there participating if you'd like to come. Um, they're also asking, and this isn't mandatory, but if you would like to bring canned goods and donations, we're going to make sure that goes to the Springboro Community Assistance. So just trying to shine a light in the community. And uh, the cool thing about Martin Luther King was that uh, he believed in the Word of God and used the Word of God as a catalyst to see wanting to see justice in the world. And, and I really admire that. Um, so we're going to be a part of that. Um, on the 31st, we, this is like, man, a lot of announcements. Um, on the 31st, we're having a member meeting right after the service, and that's our annual vote on a budget, so that's cool. So it's not just, uh, so you can be a part of that if you would like. And if you're not a member, want to be one, let us know. Um, all right, so diving in. New series today, so I'm excited. Jesus is. And we're going to be camping in this for a while, and I think it's, you know, it's interesting in society, what we used as actually our logo, I was talking with one of our people in our church, uh, uh, PR, and and he came up with this idea, and, and when you Google Jesus, this, this is the first 60 um, images that come up is what we use for our, our, uh, our image logo. And, uh, and it's like it kind of immediately reveals that there's so many different concepts about Jesus, um, d differing them on opinion on what his race was, or is he just a good man? Or if you like the movie Talladega Nights, do we pray to the baby in the manger? Or does he have a tuxedo t-shirt on and he likes to party? Um, is he homeboy Jesus? We've seen that t-shirt. Um, or even, actually, there's one that, you know, you might like. I, I, I don't know. Uh, can we pull that up? The, the, the force is with him. I think we have it, don't we? Oh, it didn't work? Well, that just flopped. There's a picture of Obi-Wan. And uh, somebody, some, I guess, grandmother set this picture of Obi-Wan Kenobi, and it really looks like Jesus, and she kind of put a little cross next to it, and I don't know. It, I guess it would be a lot more effective if you could see it. I, I thought we had it. Now I'm disappointed in you guys. I'm just kidding. You're fine. <laughs> huh? The computer exploded. Whatever. Excuses. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's all good. Well, you, you can see these images. You can see these ideas of Jesus across cultures and society, you know, um, is he a good man? Is he just a good man? Is he a prophet? Is he the son of God? And so I think if we all fill in the blank, Jesus is, and you're honest, and you were going to write out a page, I think you're, what you would probably write on that page is who Jesus is to you. And I just want to ask the question is, is what you write on that page in sync with 
what the people who knew him in the first century, what they wrote on a page. If, if you wrote your page, Jesus is, and you fill that out, and then you, you compare that with what the first century manuscripts of, of this, these people who walked and talked with him, if you compared those side by side, are they in sync? See, that's one of the most important things that we can do is not just say, who is Jesus to me, but to say, who is Jesus in reality? Because Jesus to me could be anything that is false, and we could be under false pretenses. But Jesus, who he really is, as revealed by the authors of Scripture, is really the root of what we want to get at. And so we're diving into the Gospel of John, which... I mean, immediately, I'm like excited, intimidated, all of the above. John is, immediately we know he's one of the inner close, three, the three closest disciples to Jesus because um, multiple occasions, it says Jesus went away with his three closest disciples. Um, we have an instance that was called the Transfiguration where he went into the mountain to pray and he had his three closest disciples. John's included in that. In the lists of disciples, he's always in the first three listed. But then we also have these clues that he was closest to Jesus. You're like, what? Closest. This is, I mean, he, in, he reveals his title as the one who Jesus loved. It's so funny that, like, that's how he writes about himself. This dude is hanging out with all the other disciples and when he writes about himself, he's able to write about himself, and no one gave him guff. They're like, yeah, we know who that is. When he said, the one who Jesus loved, everybody knew, that's John, the son of Zebedee. Isn't that remarkable? Like, if I walked into a family get-together, and I said, the one who my mother loves the most, everyone would know that was me. And there would be no dispute among my sisters, that I am the favored one. You see what I'm saying? This is what John, this is how he called himself, the one who Jesus loved. It's like, did he not love the world, bro? Did he not love all of his disciples? No, 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 he's just saying, look, this is the one that just was closest. One other remarkable thing about that was when you have, when you have the scene of the Last Supper, which there's been beautiful masterpieces of paintings done about this, uh, speculating what it looked like. But when it's described verbally in the narrative of Scripture, you hear that he's, John is the one reclining on Jesus. You know, you know, he's like physically hanging on him. Like, man, I just, I want to be near you, bro. I just, like, I just love you. I just want to. If they were just hanging out, I'd just put my arm around them. Like, I just like Jesus. I want to be near him. Here's him. Here's me. That's the word picture we have in Scripture about John, who wrote this account. 21 chapters about who Jesus is. 21 chapters. What a remarkable book. And John, the one who wrote it, he's in love with Jesus, and Jesus is in love with him. It's a beautiful thing. You know, and, and for those of you who don't like physical touch, Shane, um, he actually, we had some kind of weird agreement that's only imaginary in my mind that he never really agreed to, that I would get one hug a year during Christmas, and uh, he didn't hug me this year, so now I get two this year. Um, not funny. You guys are like weirded out by hugs. It's okay. We can air hug, bro. Um, but, you know... I, I have this magnet on my uh, refrigerator, and uh, my, I guess my wife's a fan of the show Friends. I'm okay with it. Um, and on the magnet, it just sometimes I'm like getting my, my, my cereal in the morning or whatever, and I'm just staring at that. I also have some Princess Bride magnets because I like that movie. Mailage. Okay. But the Friends magnet has all the characters, and it's, I, we've speculated about this. It's been a conversation in our house. When was this picture taken? And our conclusion is it was taken during season two of Friends um, because of their clothing and different things. But anyway, you guys still with me at all? There's, this is about Jesus, I promise. 
<laughs> on the little magnet, it's a picture of the whole cast of friends, and the way they are, they're like hanging on each other. And Joey has his arm around the waist of Phoebe. And I'm like, they never dated. That's so weird. Why are they touching each other? It's like, so I asked Allie, I'm like, do you have, like, do you have any friends that you put your arms around you? Because that's not cool if they do. Um, but, like, that's the idea of the show Friends, right? That they were so close. It's like, okay, we're going to take a picture now. You guys just hang on each other. We get this. That was John and Jesus hanging on each other. And, and I get we have aversions to touch in our society for a lot of reasons. Maybe you're not a touchy-feely personality. Maybe you are. They didn't have all the stigmas necessarily that we have in the ancient first century times. John was close to Jesus. I'm actually thrilled to know that because I want to get to the bottom of this. Is Jesus who society says he is? How do you judge any truth? It's kind of like what we mentioned about Martin Luther King. How do you actually objectively make a judgment about justice of any kind if you do not have, you can't decide what justice is if you don't have truth. And how do you have truth if you do not have a creator God who reveals objective truth? If all truth is subjective, then justice is subjective. And that was actually one of the most brilliant things about Martin Luther King as he revealed as we're celebrating his birthday tomorrow. But anyway, we dive into John's manuscript from the first century. It was written in Greek. It's been translated into English for us to understand it. And I believe a very reliable way so that we can, and if you have any doubt of that, you can look at the original Greek language Many words in here are, are very significant in the Greek language. Um, one is, and you read the Gospel of John, pistuo, used 98 times the word believe. Um, if you ever wonder what is the main point of John, believe, 98 times. If you ever wonder what the main point of Scripture is, believe, faith. Not just that you would subscribe to mentally to a set of doctrines, but that you would have a transformative faith. It says, you know what, I actually surrender. And I think we're going to dive into that. There's a problem, though. I, I just want to read one word. This is, this is, bear with me. This is how Steve's crazy brain works. Of course, I've already talked about friends, and I tried to show you Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I didn't even have a picture, and you're probably like, what's he talking about? But I'm going to read one word from verse 5, and then we're going to come back to it, and then we're going to read verse um, 18. This is like a really weird way to do it, but this is how we're going to do it. Verse 5, one word in the middle. It probably stands out to you. It's in there twice. Darkness. We have a problem, and the problem is darkness. How do you, are we talking about physical darkness, spiritual darkness? Bro, that was dark, man. You know, it, it, it was a really dark movie, but I still liked it. You see how we use that terminology? What's meant by this? Oh, it is a reference to physical darkness, but it is, its true meaning is used as spiritual darkness. So what is spiritual darkness? How would, how would we describe that? Furthermore, then what is the answer? And as we... Dig that up. In the process, we're going to see who is this person, Jesus. Verse 5, the key word, darkness. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. No wonder when you Google Jesus, there's Rastafarian Jesus, black Jesus, white Jesus, homeboy Jesus, Snoop Dogg Jesus, whatever. No one has seen him, but we 
one Kenobi, Jesus. Jim Caviezel, Jesus. And we all have this picture in our minds. And does that picture line up with what the word says? That's the problem. The problem is we're in darkness and we have never seen the true God. I've never seen him. That's the starting point of the narrative of John. He realizes that his audience is not just, they've been in a time of darkness. Politically, you think about the, the Roman Empire has taken more and more and more power. They've gotten rid of their, they, they kind of have a shadow government at this point. There's no real Senate. It's just all one party system that kind of just does what they want. That's why Pilate alone could decide that Jesus was crucified. That's why when John the Baptist, who we're going to read about in a second, when he, did you know John the Baptist was killed for political reasons, not spiritual? That's why we say the first martyr was Stephen. Actually, John the Baptist was beheaded first, but John the Baptist was not beheaded for preaching the gospel, even though he was a fervent preacher of the gospel. He was beheaded for speaking out against corruption of Herod. And Herod's wife goes, behead him. Talk about spiritual Darkness, political darkness. This is the setting of the New Testament readers. And then you have Greek philosophy coming in. The Greek language has now infiltrated. It's gone all around the world. Hellenism and the Greek gods. And where is real truth? How do we know in the midst of many, many gods to worship? How do we know who the one true God is? And John starts out by saying we've never. Let me just. You got my, I'm going to get your ear for a second. We don't have. We've never seen it. So let's start there. You are making a claim that God, there's many gods, and I'm making the, about to make the claim that there's one true God, but let's just start out and say no one has really seen it for themselves. Has any of us gone back 6,000 years to the moment of creation to be able to verify and say this is what happened and this is what didn't happen? Can any of us... Take a portal and go into the outer rim of space and search it out and say for certain there is no God. No, because the more we search in infinite, we find with the highest level of telescopes and technology, the further we search, we just realize there's more to search. So to be able to come to the conclusion in our best knowledge of all of the universe to say for certain that there is no God, we would have to have 100% knowledge of the whole universe, and we do not. Do you see the problem? Verse 18, no one has ever seen God. We have to hold the weight of that in our hands before we go any further. No one has ever seen God. God, can you put that burden on your back because it's going to feel so good to take the burden off in just a second. All right. Let's chip away at taking the burden off. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and life was the light of men. And light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So in the beginning, Logos, the word. I have a, I would have to say, I probably have, even in all my study, and I have a primitive understanding of what Logos is, but I would just say this. In the beginning, draws in all the Hebrew listeners because of Genesis 1.1. Logos pulls in all of the Greek listeners and says, you guys already have this concept of revealed truth that was the author, like distant but revealed truth that was the author of the universe. 
Logos, and Hebrews listeners, Jewish people, you have Jehovah, who's untouchable God, they wouldn't even write his name. Both of you who are listening to me writing this have this idea of a distant, far, untouchable God. Let's see what we can do to bring a new definition, build a bridge. Not In some wrongly, liberal scholars would say, well, he's, he's talking about, he's taking a Greek God. And it's not really true at all because um, if, you, if you really think it through, it's, it would be like me saying, um, it's the terminology like this. If I would say, I want you to log in today to what God has for you. Why am I saying log in? Because we know in our society what log in means. You have full access. You're truly here. You're ready to go. I want... That's using terminology that we understand in our context. It's contextualized information. John, in the same way, he is using each gospel has already been given, giving the detail of how Jesus was born and who he was in Bethlehem of Judea and the shepherds and the manger and the whole thing. John starts out by saying, listen, you've heard this story already. Let me come at it another way. Let me build a bridge into the Greek society. Let me build a bridge into Jehovah and shine a light on who this person is. In the beginning, all the Hebrew listeners were listening now, was the word. All the Greek listeners were listening now. And the word was with God and the word was God. This is an affirmation that Jesus is both divinity and and that the Trinity exists. This is, in theological terms, this chapter is considered one of the most richest theological chapters in all of, that we have in the whole of scriptures. I, honestly, I will never be able to do it just justice. Study this on your own, pray over it, and we continue. All things were made through him. And I would just say about that is, for all things to be made by him, he has to be unmade. For all things to be created by the word, logos, to all things, for, for him to be the creator of all things, he has to himself be uncreated. How do, you, how do you have someone who has the ability to speak things into existence, but yet, who spoke him into existence? So he's the unmovable mover. He is the uncaused cause. He is the first being Jesus. Born in a manger, but forever pre-existent Jesus. Man, there is a mystery to God. No wonder we don't blame John for borrowing from what he could make sense of this. He had to use the Greek language. He had to use Greek concepts. He had to use the Hebrew concepts to pull them in to be able to understand. Do we not lack in our ability to even describe such a God who's transcendent but yet personal? Which I'm insistent that the God of the Bible is transcendent yet personal and that only fits the description of one person, Jesus. So, but is not everything we would ever say as human beings like unworthy even when we sing, holy, 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 like, are we worthy to even sing that? Like, God has to give us grace to be able to sing to him. He has to be able to give us grace to speak about him. He has to give us grace to be able to understand his word. Because we could read the words on this page and misconstrue them, misconstruct them. We could twist them. We could misunderstand. We could, we could be living a lie if it were not for something to reveal to our hearts that we could understand. Oh, that today darkness would be rolled back. Oh, that today that our eyes would be opened. He says, in him was life, and life was light. So life is light. Same thing. No need to talk about them separately necessarily because they are the same thing. The life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. John 3.19 says this, further understanding our problem that is darkness. John 3.19, and this is the judgment, Jesus speaking, 
that light has come into the world and people loved darkness because, rather than light, because their works were evil. You know what that verse tells me? It tells me that darkness is not that we can't see. Darkness is when we won't see. Let that sink in for a second. Darkness is not that we can't see. Darkness is when we won't see. And I think that's truly the argument made by John, the close disciple of Jesus, in chapter 1. So we, we continue. Verse 6. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. Witness is a word used very much in the gospel of John. He's, he's a witness of the light. Are you a witness of the light? If you're a believer, that's the question. Are you a person, if you're a believer, are you a person who's content to say, you know what, I'm a Sunday person. I think I go to church on Sunday. Or are you a person who is literally an advocate of light everywhere you go 24-7? Not a perfect person, but you are a witness. Why? Why was John? Now, here's, this can get confusing, so I'm going to be careful here. This John, this reference is John the Baptist. He's actually the cousin of Jesus. We hear the story of his birth in other gospel accounts. So there's it's like, man, in the first century, they're naming people, same names. Isn't that weird? No, we do that today. Um, we, people have the same names. But this is John the Baptist is what they called him. And then there's John, the son of Zebedee, who was the disciple of Jesus. John the Baptist predates Jesus in terms of his ministry, was before Jesus paving the way for Jesus' ministry. John, the son of Zebedee, was one of the disciples during his ministry. He's actually the longest living disciple. He wrote the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation are the last book in the Bible. So hopefully that helps a little, but let's see what it says. And he was not the light, but he came to bear witness of the light. Now listen to verse 9. This is one of the key aspects of the chapter. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. You see how with the problem was darkness? The problem was no one seeing God, but yet the, so now the answer is, true light has come into the world to enlighten everyone. You know, we could thank Edison for lighting up the world and many others. We, we have bright lights. We, we light up our cities. We light up our homes. But what is this to be enlightened spiritually? To be awakened to see what we could not see. You see, if Jesus came, he's available. He's revealed himself through his, the word of God. And our darkness is not that we can't see our darkness is that we won't see what is our biggest need, and the biggest need is to be enlightened. What is the thing? You say, well, I've researched this, and I've heard this, and there's arguments on both sides about who Jesus was. What will tip the scale for you? What will enlighten you? What are you waiting for that will help you make that decision? Is it who told you? Is it, let me ask you this, are you completely unbiased when you read the Bible? Are you completely able to read the Bible without secular ideas twisting you to assume that Jesus isn't who he said he was? Are you able to read the Bible? Many of us here have been hurt by church. I have. Many of us have. But are you able to read the Bible about who Jesus is without a little bit of a chip on your shoulder saying, I think Christians are hypocrites and they hurt me? Because you will be enlightened if you can see Jesus despite the flaws of humanity. Because the flaws of humanity have been plaguing us 
for centuries, and they're not going to go away anytime soon. And so if you let that dictate what you decide is true or not true, then you will never be enlightened with the person of Jesus. You'll never come to true understanding of who he is. And, and I would say it this way. You are actually letting people, things, and situations, and the common thought to rule what you believe is true rather than truly discovering it for yourself. What I've found is believing in truth, not always, but most of the time, is quite unpopular. We see that through the whole history of the Bible. We see that through the all of history in period, period. If you believe what is true, many times that is unpopular. It's more convenient to believe things that are handed to us, things that are mainstream, things that are easier to explain than to believe the complexity of God became human, entered human history to redeem us and save us of sin. No, that just sounds too primitive. I know much better than to believe something like that. John said to bear witness of the light, the true light which enlightens everyone. That would be my prayer. My prayer is that me and you together, all of us, every person here, whether you are a longtime believer or someone who's not yet to truly, I would say, be enlightened or born again or saved, there's different terminology, converted. You've not yet been converted. Wherever, wherever you fall, my prayer is that we would be enlightened because there's some of us who are Christians who need to repent of our idea of Jesus. Perhaps he's the American dream Jesus to you. Where I pray and he gives me what I want. And when he doesn't, I'm mad at him. Maybe he's the genie in a bottle Jesus where you think he's going to give you your three wishes. I, I, I just pray to him when I'm in a crisis to see if I can get what I want. Maybe he's your teddy bear Jesus. He's just warm and snuggly. He would never say anything mean or hard. I just want to snuggle him. Like I said in the beginning, Jesus is. If you filled out that piece of paper with all of your ideas about Jesus, to the best of your knowledge, everything you can come up with, does it line up with what the people who hung out with him said? Do those come in sync? And for us longtime Christians, many of us are following white Republican Jesus, American dream, give us what we want Jesus. And the truth is, is he's transcendent, creator of everything, the light which enlightens everyone who is coming into the world. Really quickly, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That's part of the problem. So we have that word that stands out to me in verse 5, darkness. How do we describe this darkness? He came into the world, verse 10, and the world didn't know him. He came to his own people, verse 11, and they did not receive him. They didn't know him. His own people didn't receive him. But verse 12, here's a little hope in the, in the end of the tunnel. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. So now we have some synonyms. Receiving Jesus means believing in him. He gave the right to become the children of God who were born, listen to this, Many times I, I, I thought, okay, John 3 is when he talks about being born again. This is the first, in the very first chapter, Jesus, the story of Jesus starts with a need to come out of darkness, to be enlightened, synonym for that, to be born again. We were all born once. We were born in the flesh, but you need to be born again. You need to be born spiritually. He says, you're born not of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is a supernatural thing happening. As much as I am a fierce defender that, that God is not someone who overrides the will of men, I'm also wrapped up in the mystery that he must convict your heart, regenerate your heart so that you can believe in him. How do you even understand? 
something like that. Your heart must be enlightened. Many of us are trying to reason our way to God, and God, the Bible is not anti-reason. But in your search for reasoning, do not leave your heart behind. Because sometimes it's not, I can't see God, it's I won't. That's where our heart issue comes in. So, to those who did receive him, he made, gave the right to become the children of God. In verse 14, in the word, the logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is he tabernacled among us. This is the literal word, tabernacled. You know, and the, they had these tabernacles which represented the presence of God. This was a holy place. You can't even enter this place. He tabernacled with us. The untouchable God. We can't even write his name. We're not worthy. How is it possible? This is, this is the breaking news of the first century. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened. The untouchable creator God tabernacled. He came to dwell with us. He said, I want to be with you. And you are separated by darkness and evil and sin. You remember what happened in Genesis? He said, if you eat of the tree, you will surely die. A promise. How could God save anyone after that? Because they ate of the tree. And as our republic representatives of the federation of human beings for all time, they were broken and they passed their brokenness to us. How could God save us? There was no hope because he said those words. If you eat of the tree, you will die. Will God go back on his word? He would be a liar. But then chapter 3, verse 15 of Genesis, God gave man hope. And he said, there will be a son who is born. Genesis 3. And he will crush the head of Satan. And for centuries, human beings and followers of the scriptures were saying, who is this? What is this? Satan's tried to imitate it through pagan religions who have child worship and, and Mary worship and all kinds of other idols. There was a son to come who would crush the head of Satan. And then Isaiah writes about it, and he says, he would be pierced for our transgressions, Isaiah 53, 4. And then Isaiah 53, 7, he says, like a lamb led to the slaughter. The word became flesh, it dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John was a witness, and he cried out, This is he whom I've said. He comes after me, ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Now listen to verse 17. This is an interesting thing. For the law was given through Moses. See, that's part of our darkness too. The law never overcame darkness. The law was good. If the law is true, it's good. If the law is upheld, it's good. The law is protective. Thou shalt not kill. That protects human rights. Thou shalt not steal. That protects personal property. Thou shalt not covet. That protects against wanting this other stuff that rich people have or anybody has. I have a problem with that. When I see a really cool truck, I want that truck. I covet. I have to ask God for forgiveness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That protects marriage. Thou shalt not have any idols. That protects your heart. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. That protects our relationship with God. Thou shalt honor the Sabbath. That protects your soul so that you can rest in God. All of this, good things, but never overcame darkness. So look what it says in verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen? Now look at verse 18 with new eyes. 
No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He was made, he has made him known. Interesting point about verse 14 and 18, the word only son and only God is monogenes. In, in Greek, mono, we know that means one. Genes, similar to the genes. It means literally the only begotten son. The only, we, we are adopted sons and daughters. Jesus is the only begotten son, monogenes. He's the only one. Look at this. I mean, this is, this is remarkable. We can pull it up on the slides. The word is the life. This is what John tells us, chapter 1. The life is the light. The light is the sun. And now look at verse 29. And I have to go to it quick. We're going to close. The next day, this is talking about John. He saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The word is light. The life is light. The word is life. The light is life. And that's the sun. And the sun is the lamb. That's a lot of titles all in one chapter. We're just getting started. Who is Jesus? The word, the life, the creator, according to John. Son, the only Son, the giver of truth, glorious, according to verse 14, put on human flesh, according to verse 14, and the revealer of the only true God, verse 18, and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which is our spiritual darkness. So the question is, do you believe? I'm convinced the issue is not solely we've never seen God because he's invisible and then we put the blame on him. He's invisible. If he wanted me to believe in him and he's the guy who makes water into wine, then make me some wine. Let's go, magic boy. That's how our attitude is. If he's the one who parted waters, then do something. I'll fill up my tub and you part it and then I'll believe in you. He made bread for thousands of people. Okay, I'm going to open my cupboard. Here's some bread. Jesus, if you're real, multiply the bread. He walked on water. All right, I'm going to go to Caesar's Creek and just test this out. If you're real, then I'll walk on water. And we test and we test, and we test, and we miss a point. How do we accept what is to come, future miracles, if we cannot accept what has already come, past miracles? There is no faith in just testing God and fueling our blindness because really what it is is Steve Schick is stubborn. You are too. <laughs> We're just stubborn. May God open our eyes that we, maybe the first sin we need to ask forgiveness is a hard heart or a little bit of stubbornness. Maybe it's a big amount of stubbornness. What is standing between you and believing in Jesus? Jesus is the Word, the Creator, the life. Our very life. Zoe is the word in the Greek. He's our vitality. Believe. Would you pray with me? God, Father, we thank you for this day. I, I, I'm glad to be here. God, I just thank you, and I just pray that you would speak to us through your word. We just humbly study it, look at it, analyze it, and we receive it today. Um. We know it's infallible, I am fallible, so I just pray you'd speak to our hearts because we need the Holy Spirit. We, we need you to reveal, we need you to enlighten our hearts, enlighten our minds, 
there's a mystery here to behold. You are, you're a trinity, you're three, you're one. How do we understand this, God? You're a creator, but you became flesh. How do we understand this, God? The world is shouting you're not who you say you were. The world is shouting there's no way you spoke the world into existence. The world is shouting there's no way that sin is the real issue of our hearts. Let's all do as we would like to do in our own way. That's so revealing, God. Open our hearts to you. We just, we're here to sing about you. We're here to know you more, to study you. And I pray that every person here, that you would work in their life. Meet them where they're at, as you've done with me. We just humbly ask your forgiveness of sins. We ask you to be with our church, our community. Many have been sick. We mourn. (laughs) Many have lost lives. This year, this past year, I think if we talked about darkness, we've all felt it. How does light pierce such darkness, God? We just look to you. We look to you today. We worship you. We praise you above all others. Our hope is in you above all others. Thank you for your word. I just pray that who you are, that reality would take a grip on us. Not just an image that we can Google search, but you'd put an image on our heart of who you truly, truly are. The true light enlightens everyone, God. We are asking for that. We're asking for that. Where there is blurriness, where there is fog, I pray you'd bring clarity. Where there is darkness, I pray you would be the light. In Jesus' name, amen. I thank you for listening, for logging in. And I ask right now, if you've never trusted in Jesus, there's some synonyms, trust believe would you put your trust in him today when you trust in Jesus I just want to be honest I don't think that you have to understand 100% of this book (laughs) no one actually does except God but I can tell you what you need to do is you need to respond to what you do understand who Jesus is he's revealed himself if only today for the first time he's revealed himself In all of our seeing, we still miss to see it. In all of our knowledge, we still don't know. In all of our lights, we're not enlightened. Would you receive Jesus by believing in him today? I I, I just, I still believe that is a moment where you decide and say, Jesus, save me, come into my life. Jesus, I'm believing in you that you died for me. You're the lamb. This is real. And like John said, he's the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. My number one goal, objective, mission is that you would see that and decide for yourself to believe in Jesus. I I, I don't want to trick you into that. We always have to be careful. I, I, I think in the last year we've seen people come to faith in Christ and people baptized. And every one of those people, to the best of my knowledge, it has been their personal decision to trust in Christ. No one made them. I would do my best to answer questions. If there's a wall standing between you and Jesus, I'll do anything to tear down that wall. I'll do my best. But you have to decide for yourself. It can't be your parents' faith. It can't be your grandparents' faith. It can't be your cousin's faith or anybody else's faith. Going to church don't make you a Christian. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It's your decision to trust him. It's a faith decision, and I invite you to that. If you have already done that, I invite you, make sure as we go in the next few weeks, as we study the Gospel of John, does your definition of Jesus line up with their definition of Jesus? Are they simpatico? That would be a great place to be. We move forward unified, knowing we found the one true God who's revealed himself, Jesus. We know him. We believe in him, we've received him, now we sing to him, and we are a witness for him. Let that be so. Would you stand with us?
Would you sing with us as we close out our service with the song? And if you've never trusted Jesus, I encourage you to do that today. And if you need to talk to somebody, I'm going to be available during this next song. There's no reason to leave if you got a question. No one will make you feel foolish. You say, well, you know what? I always thought I was a Christian, but now I'm not sure. Come talk to me. Talk to me after. Talk to me during the song. We're here for you, okay? That's why we built this church, and we hope that God's glory would be through it. Let's stand. Let's sing. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace.
thank you for coming this week, sharing part of your weekend with us. Thank you for watching with us this morning. We love you dearly. We pray for you. We are so thankful for City Hope and all who enter. May the Lord be with you this week. And we can't wait to meet again next week. Just like heaven, when you walk into the room, there's not a thing that's hidden, and every eye is going in. Can't get enough of the light, it's the perfect point of view, isn't it? Just like, just like, just like heaven. sound.